there to chill, to socialize, to play card games. So this is why it's called the Chinatown's living room. <laughs> So this is Ross Alley, the oldest alleyway in San Francisco. The oldest? Yeah. yeah. Um, back in the 1850s, it was infamous for a lot of brothels, gambling, and opium dens. Huh. However, today, it's become a really important part of our community, as well as a really big tourist attraction. Yeah, there are a lot of tourists here. And um, one of these attractions is Jin Yu's Barbershop. Jin Yu's Barbershop. With our magical, bar magical musical <laughs> barber. Musical barber, yeah. <laughs> So the reason why this barbershop is so famous is because the original barber was known as sing great Frank Sinatra tunes. Frank Sinatra tunes? Yeah. And so when Frank Sinatra himself, when he came to Chinatown, he made sure to stop by the barbershop to see how good the impressions were. And they sang a couple of tunes, and he got his haircut and had a really good time. And ever since then, it was for celebrities, it was a must-to-do thing when they came to Chinatown. And that's to stop why by they've the got all their photos there in the window. Yeah, so Michael Douglas, wow. Matt Dillon, Frank Sinatra Clint Eastwood. Was here. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, they're warm. Yeah, so this is the Golden Gate Fortune Cookie oh, Factory. Yummy. They made their cookies fresh, so they taste really oh, good. so good. So a lot of people think, oh, I have a fortune cookie. They came from China, but actually, they were originally here in San Francisco. No so way. you can't even get them in China. Is that true? Yeah, so the cool thing about here is that you can actually get your own fortune made here. So you guys could probably get one that's a Happy Chinese New Year Glow Tracker or something <laughs> like that. Customized fortune cookie. Yes. Happy Chinese New Year, Globe Trekker. So this is Stockton Street, and this is actually the heart of Chinatown. It's where all the action goes on. Yeah. <laughs> and there are 19,000 residents in Chinatown, 19, and this is where they shop. Yeah. You can get uh, fresh meat, poultry, vegetables, and herbal shops, and even tea parlor in this street alone. So you can see that all these action goes on. In San Francisco's Chinatown, you find authentic, traditional Chinese culture and the modern buzz of the new. And the Chinese living in California today are living in relative comfort, enjoying the best of both worlds. However, at the time of the Exclusion Act, a wave of anti-Chinese racism in the West drove many Chinese to head east along the railroads. They settled in the more cosmopolitan community of New York, establishing the biggest Chinatown in the United States. Megan McCormick is there to check it out. It's Chinatown, New York style. Known as one of the world's greatest cities, New York is a melting pot of ethnic communities. The saying goes, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. The Big Apple is America's economic, artistic, and spiritual capital. Parks and open spaces lie between the skyscrapers, but the city's most prized possession is its people, and the Chinese New Yorkers are no exception. Chinatown on the Lower East Side of Manhattan is the largest in the Western Hemisphere. With over 150,000 Chinese here, you could almost forget you're in New York. This is Corky. He is the undisputed, unofficial Asian American photographer laureate, right? Correct. And you focus mainly on issues of the Chinese community? Yeah, the culture, the heartbeat of Chinatown. One of the things I'm going to show you today, a uh, photograph of Chinatown still life. And talks about the uh, Bachelor Society. What's and, the Bachelor Society? Well, up until about 1976, there were still a lot of single men oh. who worked in uh, restaurants. And the reason why they have so many names here is because they only were here like well, one day a week. Ah, so they didn't so, all live here, but they needed to get their mail somewhere. Yeah, so on their day off, they would pick up their mail, they'll stay here overnight, and they go back to work for like six days. And bachelors, picking up mail, crazy bachelors. Yeah, they couldn't pick up any women, though. <laughs> no? At least not Chinese. <laughs> OK. One of the photographs I had taken here was this uh, guy who actually worked in uh, Havana, Cuba. And he came uh, after Castro uh, took over because Castro expelled all the Chinese right. from Cuba. And he got reunited with his wife in 1979 because uh, uh, they had uh, been separated for about 30 years. Really? This photograph so they can send to their kids in China. 
So their children are still in China. They were separated for 30 years, yeah. and this is this their is life the... in New York once they yeah. were reunited. Yeah. Corky is recording modern Chinese-American history, which until recently has been ignored. Only a couple decades ago, Chinatown's history was almost lost forever. You see, as the older generations retired or passed away, their stuff was simply discarded into the street along with all that it represented. However, somebody saw the treasure in that trash and created the Museum of the Chinese in the Americas. Located in a former schoolhouse on the Lower East Side of New York, the museum hosts exhibitions and events that explore the Chinese immigrant experience. Back in the day, there were very few options for the Chinese who were here. One thing they were allowed to do was laundry. This was called the eight pound livelihood. Basically, over a hot stove all day, working away, pressing, laundering. It wasn't easy. Megan Chinese. meets up with John Leo, who is a guide at the museum. So what is this? This is... Um, well, actually, do you notice anything strange or different about this photo? The collage? Yeah, Just... exactly. Um, actually, the base of this photo was taken in 1961, and the rest are actually pasted in. Um, the father served in World War II and became a U.S. citizen and was allowed to bring his wife and children over. However, you have to have the proper paperwork. And unfortunately for her, they didn't have enough proof so that she, she was, was the left daughter. behind. Exactly, in Hong Kong. Oh, how sad. Exactly. So she was separated from the family for over 20 years. But here they are on paper. Exactly, and it's very critical just, to have the whole family together. Yeah, that's such a yearning, isn't it, for the, for the whole? Definitely. But they're so spread out. From New York, the next leg of the trail of Chinese migration takes me to Hong Kong, an island strongly rooted in its history. Welcome to this wonderful city, Hong Kong. From the arrival of the British in the 19th century, Hong Kong has found itself in a really unique position as a gateway between China and the rest of the world. Now, almost as soon as Hong Kong became a British colony after the Opium Wars in 1843, the city has been a halfway house, the first stop for those immigrating from China and the last stop for those re-entering the mainland. In 1997, Hong Kong was finally handed back to the Chinese, but British and Western influences can still be found throughout the city, making it an extraordinary community within China. While the Chinese were moving to other parts of the world and building Chinatowns, the British, they were right here, stamping their mark on Hong Kong. It's a great place to do business. You can travel around, you can do 10 different events in a single day in such a small area as this. This is Soho in central Hong Kong, and it's here that you see a lot of British expats having their beer, drinking their coffee, meeting friends, and people watching. So that's how it is. We give them Chinatown, and they give us Soho. A lot more Westerners coming back in after China took over a couple of years ago. It's, uh, it's a good, good place to live and a good vibe, and everyone's really friendly. The British takeover of Hong Kong not only changed the face of the city, but provided the impetus for another wave of Chinese migration overseas, this time to more than 5,000 miles away, to Britain itself. London is known as the capital of cool. Not only is it home to such familiar landmarks as St. Paul's Cathedral, Tower Bridge and the Thames, it also boasts some of the planet's best museums and art galleries. London's reputation for tolerance means the city has become a melting pot for communities from all over the world. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the first Chinese on British shores were sailors, and the first Chinatown sprung up around London docks in Limehouse. After Limehouse was blitzed during World War II, Soho in central London became the new hub for London's Chinese. 
The area's sleazy reputation meant that rents were cheap, so the Chinese seized the opportunity to start more laundry businesses. Servicemen returning from action abroad at the end of the war had acquired a taste.